We often have that contrast in the chants before we meditate, reflecting on the facts of aging, illness, death, separation, how the world is swept away, offers no shelter, when it's nothing of one's own. And then the chant, may I be happy. And really, there's not that much of a contrast. Because part of the solution is in that fifth contemplation. I'm the owner of my actions, heir to my actions, born of my actions. Whatever I do, for good or for evil, to that will I fall heir. It's through our actions that we can find happiness in the midst of all this aging, illness, death, and separation. This is why we come to train the mind. Well, it's not just the mind. In Pali, they use the word citta, which means both heart and mind. When you look at the various Buddhist cultures, and there's no clear distinction between heart and mind. The mind being the mental function that figures things out, analyzes reality, and then the heart, the part that has desires, wills things to happen. I think it's interesting that Buddhism doesn't recommend, <coughs> excuse me, doesn't recognize a clear distinction between the two, because the heart has its reasons, and reasons have their desires. The question is how to put them together in such a way that satisf satisfies both. You're clear about reality, but at the same time you can find happiness. So we. Train the mind to put those things together. Train the heart to put them together, as we bring it to the breath. You want the mind to settle down, to be still, both because it's a good place to be in the present moment if you get a sense of well-being in the mind, and because it allows you to see things more clearly. So focus on your breath. It's something that's right here. You don't have to go looking any place else for it. It's about as close to the mind as you can get in the world. Of the various properties in the body, it's the one that's most responsive to the mind. You can tell yourself to breathe long or short, heavy or light, fast or slow, and you can do it right away. At the same time, the quality of the breath energy in the body has a very direct impact on the state of the mind, state of the heart. So explore this fact. Try different ways of breathing right now to see what feels really good. Think of the breath not just as air coming in and out of the lungs, but as a whole body process. The energy that courses through the blood vessels, courses through the muscles, courses through the, the veins and arteries, out to every pore. That energy being nourishing for the body and refreshing for the mind. Because for the mind to look at things clearly, it has to have a calm and equanimous state. And before things are going to calm down, first you have to energize the body and energize the mind. Give them a sense of well-being. The Buddha talks about bringing the mind to equanimity, going beyond ordinary everyday equanimity when you're simply okay with whatever happens. You want to bring the mind to a more solid state, and he recommends two ways of doing that. One is through concentration, and the other is through insight. But in both cases, you have to go through a, a stage where there's a strong sense of well-being. In the case of insight, he gives a hypothetical case. Suppose that you're suffering from some distress about what's happened in your life. He says people's normal reaction to that is try to find some pleasure in the senses. Nice sounds, smells, taste, tactile sensations, ideas, things that make you feel comfortable for a while. 
then it's so easy to slip back into the pain again because the things of the senses are constantly changing on you. So he says you want to get out of that cycle. You develop what he calls renunciate distress, which is where you think about how there are people who found true peace, true happiness that doesn't change. And you tell yourself, when will I find that too? There's a distress there in the sense that you realize there's something you haven't attained. There's work to be done. But it's distress that has hope. The distress of the world can just leave you hopeless. Because you know you're going to go looking for pleasures, but the pleasures will change on you again. So you go for the distress that says there's work to be done. And then he says you contemplate the nature of the things of the senses. And you realize that your distress is not the result of anything particular that you've done wrong. It's the nature of sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations that they're going to change. They're inconstant, they're stressful, and ultimately they lie beyond your control. Some people find that insight gives them relief. There's a joy that comes with that. In other words, it lifts you out of the, the sting of your personal losses, and you take a larger view, a more expansive view. And then from there the mind can calm down, find a state of equanimity that's not based on sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, but it's based on insight. Other people don't find that that particular insight is joyful, so they have to take the route of concentration, like we're doing right now, focusing on the breath in a way that gives rise to a sense of ease gives rise to a sense of fullness. You can think of the energy in the body as something you can fill up, not by filling your lungs, but by simply thinking of when the breath comes in, the energy can flow everywhere in the body. This requires that you hold a perception of mind, the breath flowing in. Ask yourself, where do you feel that it flows in? Here we're not talking about the air, we're talking about the energy. Where does it come in? Or does it feel more like it's originating from inside the body itself and welling up to fill the whole body? Which perception do you find more nourishing? So explore. Try to get a sense of ease and well-being refreshment here in the present moment, by the way you breathe, by the way you allow the mind to settle in and not have to worry about anything else in the terms of the text they say that you put aside greed and distress with reference to the world. What you work on are qualities of mindfulness, the ability to keep something in mind, alertness, your ability to know what you're doing while you're doing it. And then ardency, your desire to do this well. When you have these qualities working together with the breath, you can create a sense of well-being that feeds the energy needs of the body. And when the energy needs of the body are met, then things begin to calm down. And so this way that you ultimately get to a more stable state of con concentration, more stable state of equanimity. Then when the mind has reached equanimity, either through concentration or through insight, they can use that state of mind to look into your emotions. This is where you bring the mind and the heart together. Look for where there's a state of greed, a state of lust, aversion, grief. What's going on? When you felt nourished and then the mind comes down like this, it's a lot easier to be honest with yourself about what your mind is doing to create suffering around greed, aversion, delusion. Why does it have to go outside 
to look for its happiness when it has a source of happiness inside. Or when you're angry at somebody, what do you really get out of it? There's a sense of power that comes with the anger. That has a lot of its allure right there. But so many stupid things you do when you're angry. You think you're doing something that's going to be for your benefit, and then when it's done and things calm down, you realize that you've created more problems than you solved. With grief, you've lost someone. You can look at it very clearly. You begin to see how that person seemed to become part of you. You were actually feeding on that person in an emotional, in terms of your emotions. And a large part of your identity is built around that relationship. But look what happens. Every relationship is going to end. And when it does, are you going to go looking for another one? Or would it be better to try to find your happiness inside, try to find your nourishment inside? This again is another reason why we do the concentration, because the mind can find food inside, a sense of nourishment. That allows it to step back from its old feeding habits. So as we get the mind to settle down with the breath like this, it's an opportunity to train not only the mind but also the heart. You start thinking clearly about your emotions and noticing where they do you harm when you start siding with them and realizing you don't have to go with them. When the mind is really still, it can see when a particular emotion begins and how arbitrary it can often be. We go with these emotions largely because there's force of habit, and we do get some kick out of them. That's why the Buddha says you want to look for their allure, and then look for their drawbacks. The allure is an area where we tend not to be honest with ourselves, so you have to keep looking again and again and again, because you can tell yourself about the drawbacks of things. And the mind yet still goes for them. You're still missing something. So be willing to sit with these issues sometimes for a long time before things finally clear up inside. You suddenly see things that were there all along, but you didn't see them. But this training where we learn how not to be slaves to our craving, slaves to our desires, requires that you're training both the heart and the mind. The heart is the part that goes for the allure of things. It expects some happiness out of them, some satisfaction. And sometimes it knows that it's not being honest with itself, so it likes to hide things from itself. It was a John Chow once said, one of the first things you notice as you start watching the mind and the heart is how much it lies to itself. So what you're trying to do is you get the mind into the state of nourished equanimity, where you've been through a sense of well-being, either through insight or through concentration. That's when you can begin to look at the heart and the mind and see through the lies. And then you begin to realize it was because you were lying to yourself that you stood in the way of your own happiness. You were looking for satisfaction and things that couldn't provide it. As the Buddha said, there are better things in life that are to be found as the mind gets trained. Because equanimity itself is not the end, it's just part of the path. But the insights and the concentration, they lead further. There's something that really doesn't change. And what the Buddha guarantees is the ultimate happiness. So always keep that possibility in mind. And it may be distressing. There are people who have found this, and you haven't found it yet. It's going to take some work. But as I said, it's distress with hope. 
much better than the hopeless distress that we spend so much of our time running around in. So the Buddha is showing us there is a way out. And he says, if you see that it's not going to be happy, change your views. He can't show it to you. And John Mahabhava has a nice comment. He said, if the people who have attained nirvana could show it to everybody else, nobody would want anything else but nirvana. So always keep that possibility in mind. <laughs>